Good evening, everybody. Welcome. And thank you for coming for a discussion of Susan Bernaski's wonderful new book, Clairvoyant of the Small, The Life of Robert Walser. Um, our panelists this evening, besides Susan, are Mike Mark Wunderlich, uh, Rivka Galchin, Annie Pfeiffer. And uh, before I introduce them, let me say uh, that uh, after our panelists have spoken, we'll have some time for questions from the audience and you should see a Q&A box on your screen where you can submit your questions to me to read aloud. Susan Bernofsky uh, is an associate professor of writing at Columbia University School of the Arts and director of the literary translation program in Columbia's MFA writing program. A past Guggenheim, Coleman Center, and Berlin Prize Fellow, she has translated over 20 books, including eight works of fiction by Robert Walser, as well as Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis and Hermann Hesse's Siddhartha. Her translation of Jenny Erpenbeck's novel, The End of Days, 2014, won the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize, the Schlegel Teek Translation Prize, the Ungar Award for Literary Translation, and the Oxford Weidenfeld Translation Prize. She is currently working on a new translation of Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain. Mark Wunderlich, collection of poetry, in, collections of poetry include The Anchorage and Voluntary Servitude. Since 2003, he has been a member of the literature faculty at Bennington College in Vermont, and where he became the first director of poetry at Bennington. In 2017, he was appointed the director of the Bennington Writing Seminars Graduate Writing Program. Wunderlich has taught in the graduate writing programs at Columbia University, at Sarah Lawrence College, Ohio University, and San Francisco State University. Rivka Galchin is an assistant professor in Columbia School of the Arts and the critically acclaimed author of five books. She writes regularly for the New Yorker magazine, whose editors selected her for their list of 20 under 20 American fiction writers in 2010. Her most recent novel, Everyone Knows Your Mother is a Witch, was published last summer by FSG and has been shortlisted for the Atwood Gibson Writers Trust Fiction Prize. Annie Pfeiffer is an assistant professor in the Department of Germanic Languages at Columbia University. Her research and teaching interests focus on 19th and 20th century German literature, aesthetics, and culture. Her first monograph on modernist practices of collecting is forthcoming from Cornell University Press. Together with Rito Sorg, the director of the Robert Walser Center in Switzerland, she edited Walk I Absolutely Must, a 2019 collection of essays on Walser. She is also the editor of a series on Walser at Wilhelm Fink Press. So I think that's who our panelists are. And I think we'll launch with Susan uh, telling us about um, the book. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much, Liz, for, for the introductions. And I'm so excited to have the chance to talk about my favorite writer with some favorite colleagues um, who also have relationships to his work. Um, I can't wait to hear other people talking about Robert Walser, but um, I think I'm supposed to say something about the book first, so let me do that. Um, so I'm an accidental biographer. This biography of Walser, you know, I set out to translate him and have been translating him for more than 30 years now. And sort of, he's the kind of writer whose work has so much of his own life in it. He, although he plays with what's actual and what's not actual very much, it's kind of hard to read him without getting very interested in who he was. Um, and that happened to me. And so the entire time that I was studying his work as a translator, I was also trying to find out everything I could about him as a person and looking up the addresses of where he lived and making pilgrimages to those places and looking at the places that he describes walking to, you know, going to see Lake Greifen, the Greifensee outside of Zurich, you know, which 
is a walk he described in his first published story. Um, he's somebody who's whose work and especially his late work means a lot to me where he really gets into this high modernist mode of just mashing up language and experimenting with all the different ways that language can explosively be made to signify while also resisting meaning. Um, that is such a major, theme strain is in his work, but so is the very autobiographical fact-based um, approach to writing. You know, he did a lot of newspaper writing. He did a lot of essayistic writing that was based on descriptions of everyday life. And so all these things got tangled up in my relationship with him. And the entire time I was waiting for somebody else to write a biography, because obviously that never occurred to me that that might be me. Um, why would that be me? There were all these amazing German and Swiss scholars working on his work. Um, and then decade after decade passed and nobody did it. I was expecting Bernhard Echter, who has you know, researched his life more than anyone alive, including me, to write the biography. And after a certain point, he said, nah, this is not my writing project. And he published his research as a big documentary volume, just a huge chunk of documents, which became a very important source text for my biography, along with other sort of on the spot research that I did myself. Um, if I have to say like what the major thing that I learned about Robert Walzer was from writing the biography, I would say it was this. Um, the general idea that people have about him and this is really, there's a whole mystique around his work. There's a, he has a certain cult following among a lot of, a lot of readers. And the whole idea of that this is based on is Robert Walzer as intentional outsider, as somebody who on purpose turned his back on the literary marketplace, on the whole economic side of, of artistic creation and said, you know, not for me, um, I'm going to be, off here, you know, pretending to be like an early 19th century traveling journeyman, um, strolling through quaint alleyways. Um, and this was a, this, this kind of came back to bite him because he, he, he wrote about figures like this in his work a lot, in his early work especially, and this image that he created stuck to his own persona and people's understanding of him. And it also, among other things, caused his work to be um, poo-pooed a bit in his lifetime by, by some, some readers, while others on the other hand, you know, adored him like Kafka, for example, just loved his work, really loved his work. Um, but I discovered, you know, in the course of, of preparing to write the biography and then writing it that really he was trying very hard to have mainstream success and had got a roadblock after roadblock put in, in his way. Um, and so his, his life, his artistic life, is at the same time a story of struggle. And so the persona that he kind of got, got sort of backed into this lighthearted, ne'er-do-well um, refuser of the marketplace is really something that happened to him more than that, that he chose it. And so there's this interesting tension throughout his work. I, I really learned about Robert Walzer as a businessman negotiating with publishers, trying to figure out how to make his work marketable, even though aesthetically it was always sort of on the very edge, right next to the precipice of what might possibly be marketed. Um, but there are things that just as simple as if he had picked a different publisher for his early novels, he would have had a very different career. He picked a publisher out of personal loyalties, a personal connection. Meanwhile, the um, publisher who plucked the young Thomas Mann and the young Hermann Hesse out of oblivion and turned them into major best-selling writers, that publisher, Samuel Fischler, also wanted to publish Walzer and was courting him, um, but because of the personal loyalties that, that he had gotten gotten sort of socially maneuvered into because of that 
he said no to the publisher who would have given him the career he wanted. And so sort of reading, learning about his story, there's case after case of just saying, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, but he made the choices that he made resulted in being the writer that we love. And I end my book on a question that I, I felt it would be too presumptuous to actually answer. And the question is, that I leave as an open-ended question that I end with. And maybe I'll end my, my little presentation here with this question is, um, is it possible that the Robert Walzer, that a Robert Walzer without these experiences of struggle and failure would have become the writer who was so meaningful and powerful to us? You know, I, I hope the answer to that isn't well, yeah, a writer has to struggle. I don't, I don't actually believe that's true, but in his particular case, one wonders, you know, his his late work, especially, which is the work that I care about the most deeply, I think, um, is just a one big virtuoso chronicle of failure, in a sense, and he celebrates it um, rebelliously, beautifully. Um, so, okay, that's what I have to say for starters about Robert Walzer. And I look forward to hearing others' responses to his work. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Mark uh, Wunderlich, would you, are you ready? I am ready. Um, first of all, I, I just want to thank the Society of Fellows and the Heyman Center for Humanities and everyone at Columbia for making this happen. And I'm so delighted to share a box here with uh, these writers and thinkers whom I esteem. And it's a real pleasure to be able to talk about this book. I actually wrote a little something to, to uh, fit into my time here about uh, my encounter with this biography with the clairvoyant of the small. Um, which I'll just read and then turn it over to the next. Um, this summer, I found myself on a train going through the Swiss Alps. The scenery was just as expected. Uh, cows with collars and bells grazing in meadows, slopes with heap of rubble from landslides, prim villages, chalets with window boxes, the occasional factory that looked so clean, I thought that could only possibly produce aspirin or vaccines. As the train passed through the valleys and crossed bridges, I would sometimes see farmers out raking hay into woodrow, windrows on improbably steep slopes. To say that all of it was beautiful is to state the obvious, but the experience was most notable for what was happening inside the train car. For three hours, I was the only passenger in the car. On a loudspeaker, a voice announced in three languages that this train ride had been designated a UNESCO World Heritage Experience and only the only train ride to have that uh, imprimatur. Um, and uh, that so we were informed of its specialness. It was August and the tourists had not yet returned to Switzerland. In my week there, I met no other Americans, heard no Chinese or Russian being spoken on the streets. Groups of hikers could be seen booted and toting rucksacks striding along trails, but I surmised that these were the Swiss themselves and their immediate neighbors, and not those of us from the outside. My companion on this train and elsewhere on this trip was the clairvoyant of the small, Susan Bernofsky's brilliant biography of Robert Balser. I will admit that the scene revived for my attention and won, and the book stayed mostly unopened on my lap, but in coming days, I kept re-entering the book and the world of this most singular and strange writer. The book's title, borrowed from W.G. Sebald, offers its two operative words of clairvoyant and small, and both offer their own internal contradictions. What we learn in Susan's book is how, given the very real constraints of money, social class, health, and social connection, one artist managed to produce a profoundly original body of work. It's a story of devotion that speaks to an inner connection to writing and literature, to the interior life, but also to the powers of observation. Balzer's fictions are always looking outward at the streets of Berlin, at coffee houses, at amusements, at the lives of servants, at the newspaper, 
and at the world he spent hours and hours traversing by foot. He also presents an interior life to us in his ironic and often humorous way. And this is a quote, how uncertain, how difficult people make one another's lives, he writes in Food for Thought from Berlin Stories here in Susan's translation. And never were truer words spoken. Inside the train, there was no one to challenge or support the assertion, I was alone. And as I continued to stare out the window at one of the most staggering landscapes in the world, I began to feel a bit like a ghost. Was any of this real? Where was everyone? Why was no one else here? After an hour, I heard the hiss of the electric door opening and the rattle of a trolley as an employee of the Swiss railways pushed a cart down the aisle. When he reached my seat and looked up and uh, saw the, I saw the man was dressed in a traditional embroidered Swiss shirt, a costume meant to invoke wholesomeness of the summers on the Alm, of milk pails and chocolate and bright Swiss air. Sandwich, he asked, cafe sandwich? And when I declined, he resumed his trek to the next empty car, his sandwiches promising to go uneaten. It was a scene I think now worthy of Walzer, who was so drawn to the small encounters of dailiness from which he created his great work. In reading this biography, I'm also struck by the real miracle of the existence of Walzer's work at all. In many ways, his life was not a dramatic one as we learn. In fact, much of it, as it is for all of us at times, a series of dull interludes, working in an insur as an insurance clerk, living in an asylum, walking and walking alone in all weather. But that is the contradiction at the center of the lives of writers. The external life is that is what one sees, but in the, in but in the inner life is, while writing and thinking, where one lives. This too is what we learn about in Clairvoyant of the Small that the best writers find ways of shaping their lives so that their inner worlds can live and thrive. I finished reading the biography one night in an unlikely place, which was the bed, a bed once occupied by Rainer Maria Rilke. For the past few years, I have immersed myself in the work of this poet and in the literature of Central Europe, of Central Europe written in the decades preceding and following the First World War. This is the literature that describes in part a lost world. A contemporary of Walzer, Rilke lived a, lived a much different life, one that he created with the ingenuity of his work, but also with his great social gifts, which he deployed as the perpetually charming guest. I was in a remote village in Switzerland called Zolio, where Rilke had spent five months as a guest in a hotel, a hotel that re remains almost unchanged since Rilke's visit there 103 years ago, down to the furniture in the rooms. From this bed, not the most comfortable, I reached the moment of Walser's demise, one of the loneliest and most poignant deaths I can think of, collapsing alone in the snow, and which was documented with a blurry, almost Sebaldian photo that never fails to sadden me and even to shock me. I am grateful to Susan Bernofsky for her scholarship, her ample gifts as a translator, her thorough and humane work that has given us this insight into the life of the smallest giant of German literature. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Rivka? Uh, thanks, Mark. I, that was a beautiful way in. And I, I sort of like picturing us all in this uh, kind of a train car, mysteriously alone. Um, it seems like a good way to kind of find a connection to this figure from the past. I was going to share like a tiny bit, just because, of course, there's something about Walzer that turns people into their um, own relationship to how he arrived to them, because he doesn't arrive on the Grand Marquis. He always <laughs> arrives somehow slipping in in some other way. And I, I first encountered Walzer um, in a store that um, I'm sure everyone knows, the bookstore that was called Labyrinth at the time on 112th. And there was the New York Review of Books um, collected shorts of Walzer. And it was, of course, on the remainders table. I think it was $7. I don't know why I bought it. I saw like the sort of profile of the man there. And it just like called to me as it has called to so, uh, as, it, as it is called to so many people and always sort of, again and again, I think arriving in this kind of minor way. And, and I was 
thinking about this biography, I knew Susan was working on it, all embarrassed her. I knew she was working on it for a very long time and she was trying to find her way into it. And I thought it does seem a bit impossible because the very format of a biography is quite kind of grand and here I am and it's like, a, it has a kind of number of pages, more pages than I think Walter likes to put together. And I thought, how will she kind of do this kind of translation of his life, of the evidence of his life into this format. And I just want to say that it's just an absolutely kind of magnificent biography, completely true to his spirit. Not just that it uncovers true things about his life. I kind of trust Susan on that, but that the kind of details that she brings in and the slight wryness and humor with which she brings them in feels so, so fitting. And, um, and also the kind of what I think of as like a, a derangement of scale, but really a rearrangement of scale. Um, so there'll be like a moment, um, like there's many quite tragic moments in Walter's life, even before the end. And, and for example, there's a, a little bit about his otherwise relatively undocumented time in Berlin. Um, when he wrote Jakob von Gunten, one of his sort of more famous novels and, and his brother Carl's girlfriend is sort of who we can picture this figure even now kind of a young aspiring dancer um, has killed herself has committed suicide um, when she's sort of seen that Carl um, has sort of taken up with another woman and and Walzer is on the one hand processing this and living in Carl's apartment um, at and has this strange way of saying things like, well, she, I'm surprised she didn't shoot my brother instead of herself, like brings in the kind of, kind of the strange affect of Walzer, which can be startling in so many ways. And at the same time, like these detailed reports of how he was feeling about taking care of Carl's dogs and whether the dogs were well, and the way that the, this sort of, all these scales of like events that feel emotionally large and events that, are less obviously emotionally large, the way that they get juxtaposed and the way that feels so true to the way one might process um, all sorts of different feelings, whether it's ambition, tragedy, all, all these things feel so characteristic to Walter. And I felt like throughout the biography that this was a biography made out of charismatic details. And I feel like that's how Walter himself weaves his stories and, and I just took a lot of pleasure in those resonances because it, it just seemed impossible and somehow Susan Susan did it and she also did this wonderful thing where some of Walzer's best work or like not his best work some of the work that I connect to the most and that I think many people connect to the most um, were written with pencil with that kind of hesitancy of something that could be um, quickly erased um, and Susan goes into this in detail. So we learned that he actually was like, not just shrinking his handwriting and, and being smaller and smaller, but also hesitant. And, and we see the way that this is both demanding. It demands a lot of the person who's trying to read this tiny and faint thing and also recessed and distant. And I, I felt again, like that the biography respected and embodied that hesitancy, ambition, desire to be seen, fear of being seen, all those things together. And, and it's just an absolutely beautiful project um, that, you know, so often when you read a biography, it's almost as if the work gets a bit blotted out. And, and in this case, I, I just felt like there was like a volumetric trick and like his work, kept its kind of luminous, strange, mysterious charisma, but felt even more full. Um, so that was really what I wanted to say, just how, how moving it was and kind of what was unusually difficult about applying this kind of base. I love biography, but it is a kind of heavy handed large book form. That's the way we think of the genre. And, I, and that it seemed like quite impossible to use this genre uh, in an other than informational way about Walter and that Susan somehow pulled it off that it's a really beautiful project. And, and I wanted to thank her for it and for her translations, of course, because she's brought him to so many of us.
Thank you. Thanks, Rivka. That was a wonderful presentation. And uh, I, I absolutely agree with you about the book. It's, and he's a, an unlikely subject for a big book. Um, and she did so much to show on the page, that in the work and on the page, you know, the evolution of these things that you were just talking about. Thank you. Uh, Annie. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me on this panel. It's such a pleasure to talk to all of you and hear from Susan herself. So I'm also going to be reading a short statement. Um, and I think it picks up on something that everybody has mentioned, which it seems like Susan Bernofsky has managed to produce a kind of very Walzerian um, biography of Walzer in some way uh, with using his writings uh, as a guiding uh, form. Uh, so I, I just wanted to sort of take a moment to reflect on that. In addition to producing their own stories, writers often give sto rise to stories about themselves, lore, which contributes to their persona as writers. It can often be difficult to disentangle these stories. As an Auslandschweizerin or Swiss person who lived most of my life abroad, I always felt naturally drawn to Robert Walzer. <clears throat> himself a kind of outsider who, even after returning to Switzerland from Berlin, seemed to be a sort of itinerant nomad. During some lonely moments while spending uh, my postdoc in Bern, I took solace in the fact that Walzer, my compatriot, had had similar impressions of Switzerland's picturesque but evasive capital city. But what kept me coming back to Walzer after many years was the community of people that read and loved him, the admirers and fans, if you will, People like Susan Bernofsky, Jonathan Franzen, Ben Lerner, Walter Benjamin, and W.G. Zewald, from whom we get Bernofsky's title. As we learn in Bernofsky's beautiful new biography, this fandom arose early um, with people like Kafka, who took great delight in reading Walser's pieces aloud to Max Brod, Kafka's future biographer. And in some ways, it seems fitting to me, at least, that this writer, who sometimes lived in desperate isolation, should have also produced a community of readers and fans, often completely unbeknownst to Walzer himself. Like many literary geniuses, his persona became part of his story. In 2019, the artist Thomas Hirschhorn created an interactive 86-day-long Robert Walzer installation in Biel, Switzerland, Walzer's hometown. And Susan, I think we were both there, right? Uh, giving talks at different moments. It was a sprawling structure covered in DIY banners and spray painted texts. Are all Walzer fans in some sense super fans? I wondered as I glimpsed the massive sign, Robert Walzer, love you forever from the train station. It was visible from all around the countryside. <laughs> it's hard to imagine this kind of homage to Walzer's contemporaries like Thomas Mann or Hermann Hesse. When I first met Susan Bernofsky in 2017, it was at a Walser conference in Bern that I had co-organized with Reto Zorg, the director of the Robert Walser Center. The subject of the conference was Walser's short story, Der Spaziergang, or The Walk, which plays an important role in Susan's biography. And it actually coincided, as we realized, uh, with the 100th year anniversary of its publication. But in a remarkable essay for our collected volume, Bernofsky describes the difficult task of translating in the footsteps of the poet and translator Christopher Middleton. And I wanted to quote from her essay because I think it um, really resonated with me. Um, uh, and she, I think in doing this, evokes the, um, the sort of horrifying no, mo, um, image of Walzer's solitary death in the snow while on his walks. And she writes, quote, translating is like walking through deep snow that another person has already walked through. Every translation retraces another writer's footsteps. This time I was following in a double track. I wonder if we could see Bernofsky's biography as another kind of walking through deep snow, but instead of Walzer's words, she painstakingly retraces his ambling footsteps after the snow begins to melt and his tracks shrink before vanishing completely. With Walzer, who destroyed many of his letters and manuscripts and had more than 65 known addresses, I love that you included the index of all his addresses in the back of your um, biography. This is no small feat. As Bernofsky herself points out, there are many gaps. So I'd be interested, maybe we can do this in the, uh, the Q&A afterwards, to know a little bit more about the relationship between translating and biography. To what extent does Bernofsky's task as a translator inform her task as a biographer? 
There is a subtle and ingenious way, I think, that Bernofsky inhabits Welser's own mind in the intimate way only a translator can. Um, but at the same time, she always lets him speak for himself, whether it's through his letters or his often autobiographically inflected stories. And she lays out her approach in uh, the introduction. She, she writes, the stories I tell about Balzer's life are interspersed throughout this book with discussions of his most important works and the place they stake out for him in the literary canon. And I think the emphasis on stories in the plural is key to her interpretive framework, which resists overarching meta narratives and letting uh, the, the work of Balzer himself guide our way as much as possible. So Bernofsky's biography is a profoundly Balzerian approach to Walzer, uh, mining the details with clairvoyance and judiciousness, but without judgment and generalization. Although she sheds light on many of the mysteries surrounding his life, Bernofsky lets the aura of Walzer, the author, remain a slightly shadowy figure who surprises us just as we figured, we thought we figured out who he is. And there were many surprises in the book that I myself didn't know. For instance, I didn't realize that he had actually been a proud soldier in World War I. Um, or I uh, sort of defending Swiss, Swiss neutrality in World War I. Um, but I think most importantly, and people have already talked about this, um, Bernofsky doesn't dwell on or fetishize his mental decline. Instead, she presents him as an agent in his own life. Bernofsky's Walzer is an ambitious literary artist troubled by financial and mental difficulties, which were only heightened by all the geopolitical crises that were occurring. Even later, as his mental illness becomes acute, Balzer continues to publish until he's transferred to, uh, in 1933 to another asylum against his will. So it might be tempting to conclude, as many have done, um, that Balzer's mental health is in some way connected to his ever-shrinking handwriting um, in, in his now famous microscripts, the hundreds of tiny paper slips covered in millimeter high script that were found after Balzer's death. However, I think, again, Bernofsky paints a more complex picture. She notes, for Walzer, writing, became small, writing small became particularly appealing when the thrift inspired by his fear of poverty made the conservation of resources align with his desire for privacy in this instinctual gesture of self-preservation. Ever the conscientious biographer, Bernofsky makes an effort to disentangle Walzer's own story from those recounted by others. And here too, I think, Bernofsky's own path as a writer and translator informs her humility towards the story subject, um, a gifted storyteller in her own right. Bernofsky is always aware that she is telling stories rather than a single story. As Walter Benjamin, another avid reader and fan of Balzer observes, Geschichte or history is always made up of Geschichten or stories in the plural. Thanks. Thanks so much, Annie. That was an excellent presentation. Susan, would you like to respond? I have some questions too, and I'm sure everybody does, but would you like to respond to some I, of the things that everyone said? I'd, I'd love to respond a little and then sort of maybe start a conversation among us before we open it up to the crowd. This has been so wonderful to hear you all talk about your love of Walzer and your discovery of him in different ways. And thank you for saying nice things about my book. Also, um, thank you, Mark, for doing the thing that I should have done um, and was too excited to remember to thank the Society of Fellows and the Heyman Center so much for, for having this event. I'm so thrilled for the opportunity to, to talk about the book and Walzer in this context. So thank you. Um, okay, so I have new favorite quotes about Robert Walzer, Mark Wunderlich says, smallest giant of German literature. <laughs> um, Rivka Galchen says, charismatic details, which is such an interesting way of thinking about the way Walzer writes, because it's true. Um, you know, he, it's, his, his work is all about this sort of derangement or rearrangement of skills. Gail, as Rivka says, you know, too much attention paid to something that doesn't seem like it should be the center and the other way around. And that is a really beautiful description of the strange lopsidedness of his literary world that makes him so appealing to us. Mark, I cannot believe you slept in Rilke's bed. I just, I just don't know what to say about that. Um, although I myself did sleep in the tower room where, um, where Joseph Marti, the, the um, protagonist of The Assistant, 
sleeps in the novel that is that room exists and I've been a guest there which was really really strange but that's an that's a story for another time um Annie Pfeiffer's question are are all Robert Walzer fans super fans and this is weirdly right um people don't just admire his work they love it there's something about his work that inspires this strange irrational you know passionate love and that, you know, I don't know if I even quite understand it, but it's this slight sense of off balanceness that that makes you see the world differently. You know, I've been reading him for so many years. And when I read him, when I read new sentences, sentences I've forgotten, he still just kind of blows my mind constantly as a writer. And it's his way of describing the world in, in that, such that you see relationships and relations within it differently, strangely, wrongly. Um, the question um, about the relationship between translating and biographizing a writer, yeah. Um, it's really funny. I came into this project feeling that I knew a lot about Robert Walzer because I'd been ventriloquizing him for so many years. and soon realized, you know, wow, there's a lot of projection there on my part, but also on his part, because, you know, as, as Annie said, you know, writers produce their own lore, but he especially produces his own lore, you know, and part of the reason that he got sort of put in this area of Mr. Small is that he kept saying, I'm Mr. Small. And in fact, he's not, he's Mr. Maximalist, but in this small scope. And there's this, this complex largeness and smallness at odds with each other in his work. Um, this book is a big book. For me, it's a really big book. For Walzer, it would have been a big book. It was even bigger. Um, this book was a third, was a half again as long when I first turned it in. I found so much stuff and, you know, I'm new to biography writing. Yeah, I didn't know what I was doing. I put way too much stuff in it and had to pull a lot of stuff out of it to kind of have a through line. Otherwise it was, it was too much like a big catalog. Like, you know, I was telling the story of like, I talk about Paradeplatz um, in Zurich, the square where the, where the banks are and where the insurance company first works with are, but like I learned so many interesting things about that, that place, you know, you know how there's the great chocolate shop probably right there where if you've passed through Europe, you have bought chocolate there, or if you haven't, you have to go back and buy chocolate there. The reason that that place, that chocolate shop is there is because originally it was thought that the train station would be there. And David Sprungli wanted to have his chocolate shop right next to the train station. So he built it there before the train station. And then they moved to put the train station some, you know, and so, so all these side stories, they're really great stories, but they tell us nothing at all about Robert Walzer. So in the end, they are on the cutting room floor. Um, I wanna hear about other, your, your questions for each other too, but a question that I would want to put out there is um, those of you who, who are Walzer lovers, which I think is all of you, um, do you have a favorite book by him or a favorite text by him? When you think about, you know, Walzer, is there, is there some text that makes you think, oh yeah, this is the Walzer I love? I, I don't know if I have a favorite text, but I will say that Basically, for a decade of my life, every time I applied for a job, I would use his short story called The Job Application, <laughs> which is the most kind of um, kind of excessively humble, self-humiliating, and kind of, <laughs> it kind of turns the corner to basically wild aggression, <laughs> basically saying, not only do I not want this job, and I promise I'll be terrible at it, but also like, I'll just be ever so grateful if you'll let me be a nothing in front of you. Like I'm sort of paraphrasing it. It's, it's just a magnificent thing. So it's not my favorite, but I found it my most useful. It's my most useful Walter story. And many, many years ago, I got my first internship at Harper's, I think in large part from, uh, from that story. It's a very Harper's type of uh, application. I was very surprised, Susan, because we've always heard about him as an outsider and, uh, and, and his failures. I was surprised at the vast number of things he did publish, which you, you, when people talk about him, 
they don't talk about him in that way. Mm -hmm. And I realized as I went along that this was not satisfying for him. The women in his life were not satisfying. The connections with friendships. And I, I, I felt like reading it, it's a beautiful book, but it's, it's as if a, a cello is playing sad notes throughout the whole thing and did that was that hard for you I mean I know writing is writing and it's you know it has to do with getting what you want down on the page but it the great sorrow of his life get you down it it, it, it did I mean the ending was really hard like writing writing about the sort of the breakdown that led to his institutionalization and then sort of how things went for him that after that that was actually really hard but a lot of other times, even when things were, you know, he, he's, he's not Mr. Pity Party, you know, there are some texts of his that are, that are sort of mournful texts, but really that's the tiny minority of texts in, that he actually writes. And so, you know, he's, he's writing this, he's writing triumphantly and joyfully about things going wrong, which is weird displacement, sure. Um, that helped. Right. That I helped. was struck too by how you were taking the very walk along the lake that he took. And I took the walk that you took because I worked in Zurich for a year and, and along that same sparkling lake across that mm -hmm. bridge to Schwanengasse in the old guild section. I felt I was walking along with you in Walser as I read about those walks. Wow. How have we not had this conversation I before? <laughs> Thank you, Heyman Center. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have, I have, this one is, is one of my fa favorites. I don't know if you can see it. It's the um, Kleine Dichtungen uh, from him, the, the small, small poems, um, that, that he has. And, but, you know, of course there, there are these, these short prose, you know, that he's writing, although there are these, he does write some verse, right? There is, there are these examples of it. And, and I love it when he also breaks into verse, right? Um, occasionally and has it because they're so weird. Yeah. They're, they're so very yeah. peculiar. His, his, you know, that sense of it. I just, I just love that uh, part of it. So. Mark, would you translate some of those? Sure. You would be, you would be fantastic as a, tra you know, I, I translate his prose and I translated some of the, the poems for, for this book, but I'm, I'm kind of a prose translator. I would so love to see some some of those weird poems of his translated by you. I would I would love to take a crack at them because you know I it's when that happens I just they're they're um what's so interesting to me about them is that they really do I read them and I think oh they they move into sort of the fully modern I mean he's often rhyming you know there's often this kind of uh, late romantic kind of pattern and sound, but his juxtapositions are so that they're they're jarring, they're they're confusing, they kind of startle yeah. the reader as you move through them. And I just right. I love it when he does that. He rhymes uh, too much and wrong. Yes, yes, that's right. It's actually it's it's not it doesn't sit in the ear well, you know, it's not it's it's actually meant to um kind of you know how rhyming can can both be soothing, but it can also be demented. You know, and it, it's it's like it has both of those things. It's it's actually both a you know it feels like a strange compulsion, and once you get started, you can't stop. You know, yeah. and um, like in the Princess Bride or something. You know, it had becomes that kind of annoying piece that you do, and and he does that, and it sort of sits sits on the, in the ear in a strange way. I, I had a copy of this book years ago, and then it I couldn't find it, and it was this summer when I was on the Paradeplatz. I went to the big fantastic bookstore and I got my other copy of it. So that, that, that's that, a favorite that, one. That is great. I'm trying to remember how I translated that title now. I think that's the one I translated as Little Writings. Um, but there's so many of his, so many of his titles are similar. Um, I've lost track of it. Hmm. Um, would it be okay for me to proceed with the, some of the questions from the people outside or, or do you want to go on? Susan? It's okay with me to proceed if okay, nobody proceed. else wishes to. Okay, proceed. Uh, Kate Green is asking, his walking habit, his shrinking writing, did you find in the depths of the most intensive writing portions of the biography that any of your own habits changed or intensified 
or in what ways did living inside Walser's life affect you, if at all? You know, I found myself feeling sort of a little embarrassed for living in a well-heated place um, with um, enough to eat when I, while writing about his struggling with very fundamental things and trying to get people to give him money and not running the heat to save money. Um, I thought a lot about that reduction of, of quality of life. Um, but it was also, I was also reminded that he did choose this mode of being on purpose. You know, he kept having jobs. He, he kept having jobs that would have made okay day jobs for a writer, you know, he had the day jobs and was convinced that having a day job would kill him as a writer and didn't want to do it. Could he have done it? I don't know, you know, um, as someone who, I say, I'm going to say someone who loves him, although I think that if I'd met him in real life, he might have frightened me. Um, I'm an easily frightened person. And he was very, I think, you know, had lots of moving pieces. Um, but there's something I think really headstrong about his, his choices and his unrelentingness and how consistently he followed through with them. I did wind up thinking a lot about that. My writing, um, I type all the time now, so my writing is a mess. It's hard for me to tell what, what's happening with my writing. I can barely read it anymore. I don't know what others may be having this experience too. Um, Carl Niekirk um, writes- Hi, Carl. In uh, Geschwister Tanner, there is this scene in which we find the protagonist in a poor people restaurant, and he sees a man praying intensely above a plate of potatoes, all he can afford. The protagonist then quickly orders a piece of meat for the man so that when he is done praying, he finds it on his plate. Is this somehow metaphorical for what Balser seeks to accomplish in his writing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay. That, 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 that place was a real place. That place still existed when I was studying in, in Zurich. Um, I think it was called Café Carl. Um, um, but that sort of place where, you know, where you could eat for cheap, where, you know, you could experience a sort of um, patron edge, you know, in the form of food, but I think it's an important thread in his work, um, helping others, helping artists. Um, I'm sure he would have liked to be in a position to do that. And he certainly would have liked to have received more of that patronage himself. Right. Um, Elizabeth Graver says, Susan, you've been obsessed with I Robert Walser since I first met you when you were <laughs> all 22 years old. How has the fact that he's been a literary companion, companion to you over your whole adult life impacted your <laughs> his life in a biography? Do you see his life differently, differently now than you would have at 22? That is such an interesting question. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I, re I really do, you know, because as I have grown, I've, I've grown, when I first encountered his work, my my feeling about him was just one of awe. And now that I've become middle-aged myself, my feeling of him is artistic awe mixed with this sort of maternal desire to, to take care of him or some, you know, <laughs> he really needed it. Um, so I think my, my, my emotional relationship to how to the, to the, the, person I see him as being has changed a lot just through my growing but um, that excitement that I had about his work is still there which surprises even me you know there are all kinds of writers I loved when I was 20 I don't who I don't love now but he is a writer I loved when I was 20 who I still deeply love now well However complicated Balser is you're now engaged in writing a biography of Thomas Mann the, that should be easy I'm translating the Magic Mountain. God forbid I should write his biography. Just translating this book might do me in. It may be, who knows, it might be the last thing I do. Um, 
it's it, Thomas Mann is like the opposite of of Robert Walzer. You know, he's the the massive must must have more pages, must be more important, must show my importance. Thank you. Um, panelists, do you have anything else you want to bring up? If not, I think we're just about done here. I didn't say my favorite Bowser story, yeah, um, Annie, Annie yeah, which I think picks up exactly on what um, Susan was just saying, which is that he does age well in a way. Um, and I think that the sort of growing interest in, in Balzer, especially in, in the US, you know, uh, in the last 20 years is a testament to that. But one, I wanted to make a plug for Balzer's fairy tales, which I think are pretty wonderful. Um, I was actually, I, I work on fairy tales in my own work. And I had recently read Sleeping Beauty, his version of Sleeping Beauty, where um, the, the, the woman is really annoyed that she's woken up by the prince and everything is sort of very, uh, it's a perfect sort of Balzerian take on a classic tale. Um, so that was sort of recently surprising me as, as you know, one of the kind of texts I hadn't read by Walzer that um, was still moving. And I thought it was especially interesting after reading your account of his inner war period where he was sort of, you know, struggling, um, and I think I have a new reading now because of the way that you portrayed his, his time in the war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I mean, and those have recently, you know, issued a new translations with, in, from New Directions that, that y'all can, can find if you read him in, in, in English. But you know, the, the war years were news to me too. I really, you know, I had a lot of areas of his life had been written about a lot. Um, but his, his military service, which he did for years, um, and which really, really, um, disrupted his writing career at a point where he was supposed to be getting it back together as a writer. And it, it was a, you know, it was just a whole series of monkey wrenches, although, and interestingly, he didn't choose to write very much about that period of his life, you know it would have made for interesting stories later. He also, by the way, um, for, for listeners who, who haven't read the biography, um, apropos of, you know, long 2020, got the influenza in the big 1918 influenza epidemic. Um, it didn't kill him, which was a fortunate thing because he was in the age group most likely to die of it at that time, um, but, but he recovered. So yet another way that he um, is relevant today, <laughs> Survi yeah, surviving, have, surviving a pandemic. Right, we have a, another question has come in from Nahi Patel. When hey, writing Nahi. about Walser's breakdowns, did you make any surprising discoveries that did not make it into the book? Do you think that Walser could have been saved from the asylum? You know, that's a great question. And as long as I have been, you know, studying Valzo's work, this has been a huge question, you know, did he have to go into the asylum? I had a lot more thoughts about that than I wound up writing, all, among other things, just because, you know, who am I to speculate about someone's mental health at great length based on a diagnosis from you know, more than, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, also, you know, as I write in the book, you know, diagnostic frameworks have changed so much and understanding of what the disease schizophrenia even is have, have changed a great deal. Um, there was a period when, when I was first making trips to Switzerland in the late eighties and 1990s, that was a period where there was a lot of indignation in the Walzer community about his having been institutionalized. You know, this the sense, um, you know, the 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 institution, the you know, the asylum industrial complex came and got him and took him. Um, so I went. I also, like everybody else, felt that because there had been an earlier stage of Walzer reception in the '70s and '80s where people were you know writing books about like let's let's use the the framework of mental illness to 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 explain his writing which is just like oh no please um so the, you know backlash to that come on he wasn't sick we're all a little weird um 
I was a little surprised, you know, from reading the accounts, you know, I read his medical record talk about invasion of somebody's privacy in retro retrospect, um, you know, to really discover how ill he was, um, how much he did struggle, you know, from what I had heard, you know, people talking about in the 90s, okay, you know, he wasn't really hallucinating. They probably just forced him to say that, you know, they broke him down until he, he said it. But in fact, you know, from reading his medical record, it seems there, you know, many people said from many different points of view, yes, he struggled with serious hallucinations for a long time. Now, if he had been living, you know, in the 21st century, it's quite possible that there are, you know, psychotropic drugs that would have helped him and, you know, would have, you know, put him in a quite different state. Um, but I think that he, he did need looking after. I also remember hearing people being really indignant, you know, that his, you know, his sister must have done this to him. Why did she not just take care of him? Like, like a loving sister should, um, you know, and he's really, he was really quite a handful. And I think her defending her own life against the imposed responsibility of making, you know, caretaker of her brother be her job for the rest of her life. You know, I, I get that. And so it just seemed like he got backed in this, into this corner of needing to be institutionalized because he didn't have good other options. Um, yeah, um, it seemed to me to make sense in retrospect, unfortunately. He could have gotten out. I think that in later life, he might have gotten out, but after a certain point, you know, he was of a certain age and to be, you know, in your 60s, 100 years ago was different from being in your 60s now. That was older than it is now. Um, after a certain point, I think he would have had trouble taking care of himself. Right. So. I have one more question. You, you said earlier that you like his later work the best or, mm -hmm. or you're particularly fond of his later work. Yeah. Like a lot of writers, there were periods in which he almost could do no wrong and people were publishing sort of everything he's like threw out the window. Uh, and then in his later life, he had a lot of trouble having anything accepted whatsoever. But you're yeah. saying that that work is the work that you really like. Did, did yeah. that shift happen because of poor judgment of the publishing world? Or was what, what, what was that about from your point of view, his writing or the world that he was writing in? You know, I think that he was producing high modernist literature 10 years too early for it to be well accepted. He was writing work that was just very anti-mimetic at a period when that wasn't yet such a thing or, you know, it might, you know, the Dadaists were off doing their thing, but that was sort of marked as, you know, as its own little thing, but it wasn't, you know, this, you know, Joyce's Ulysses wasn't yet circulating. It wasn't, you know, the, 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 the books next to which his work would have sat in, com in, in interesting conversation weren't yet there. So I think he was just aesthetically a little ahead of his time, which is a shame for both him and the time, frankly, you know, you know, but I think that's, the, that's why his work has, has been so exciting for later writers, you know, it, it, it it, it was modern in the, in the sense of it, you know, that kind of writing could have been done in the late 20th century too, I think. Um, and so the, the, he was un zeitgemäß, he was not of his period in that sense. And I think that, you know, that was to his detriment, but it was all to our, to our great benefit. Thank you so much. I think, the evening is over. Thank you, panelists, for wonderful presentations. Thank you, Susan, for writing this excellent, riveting book. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this evening. And Thank you so much, everybody, for coming to talk about Balzer with me. This, is, this has been just such a great treat. And I will remember all the very intelligent things you said about Robert Balzer. Thank you for teaching me and for reading my book. <laughs>